Coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline, a special edition featuring excerpts from the CBN documentary, Whose Land Is It Anyway? We'll look at Israel's claims to the land based on biblical mandate, archaeological evidence, and international law established in the 20th century. We'll also see how defensive wars resulted in the expansion of Israel's territory. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to the special edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. We're departing today from our usual program to bring you excerpts from the CBN documentary, Whose Land Is It? It's an in-depth look at the history of Israel's claim to the land, which is very relevant now as the country fights jihadists on seven fronts. Before we get to the documentary, this week Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the Iranian-backed Tutis in Yemen will pay a heavy price after they fired a long-range surface-to-surface ballistic missile on Sunday. And there's political upheaval in Israel's war cabinet, as Benjamin Netanyahu is reportedly set to dismiss his defense minister. All this as Israel is warning of a major operation against Hezbollah in the north. Take a look. The Houthis released footage of the launch they say covered more than 1,200 miles in just over 11 minutes. Parts of it caused minor damage in central Israel after being hit by one of Israel's aero interceptor missiles. The Houthis military spokesman sent Israel a warning. The Israeli enemy should expect more strikes and upcoming special operations as we approach the first anniversary of the blessed October 7th operation. At Sunday's cabinet meeting, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the Houthis will pay for this attack. Netanyahu pointed out Israel struck a key Yemeni port in July after the Houthis launched a drone that killed one and wounded ten in Tel Aviv. The Israeli Prime Minister is also warning Israeli forces may be about to turn their focus to Hezbollah, one of Iran's key proxies in its war against the Jewish state. The goal of Netanyahu's government is to return some 60,000 Israelis forced out of their homes in the north by nearly daily rocket attacks from Hezbollah. The current situation will not continue. We will do whatever is necessary to return our residents securely to their homes. Israeli warplanes are already striking Hezbollah targets in Lebanon to weaken the terror group before what could be a full-blown Israeli ground invasion of southern Lebanon. Several Israeli media outlets are reporting that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is about to fire Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. The two have been at odds since before the war, and most recently over the Philadelphia corridor in Gaza and the hostage negotiations. Gallant told President Biden's senior advisor Amos Hochstein on Monday that Israel is close to taking massive military action against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. In his meeting with Hochstein, Netanyahu said Israel will do whatever is necessary to end Hezbollah's threat. Turning to the south, the UN Security Council met Monday to discuss humanitarian aid for Gaza. One controversy is whether UNRWA is helping or hurting Palestinians. Israel's ambassador to the UN accused UNRWA of teaching hatred against Israel and the Jews, which only prolongs and intensifies the conflict. UNRWA Gaza has become nothing more than a cartel, fostering hatred and prolonging misery in Gaza. He also accused UNRWA of employing Hamas terrorists who took part in the October 7th atrocities. Each of these terrorists were Hamas military operatives. They had a day job and a night job. Each of them was employed by UNRWA. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, the oldest land dispute in history. Excerpts from CBN's documentary, Whose Land Is It Anyway? In 1967, Israel captured Biblical Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank from Jordan, in the Six-Day War. UN Secretary General Kofi Annan referred to Israel's presence there as an illegal occupation. Secretaries of State John Kerry and Hillary Clinton both called it illegitimate. 
And today, many world leaders still refer to this land as occupied territory. But are those terms historically correct? Here's a look at Israel's claims to the land. It's the oldest land dispute in history. For centuries, Jews and Arabs have both claimed to be the rightful owners of the land of Israel. Jewish claims to the land are based on four main arguments. The first is God's promise to Abraham. Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion often said that the Bible was the Jewish mandate for settling the land of Israel. In the book of Genesis, God gave the land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of Israel. And the rest of the Bible tells the story of their descendants in the land. Moses led the Jews back to Israel after their exile in Egypt. And roughly 400 years later, around 1000 BC, King David conquered the city of Jerusalem and built his capital there. But the story of the Jews isn't limited to the borders of modern Israel. Their footprints have been traced throughout Judea and Samaria, now the Palestinian West Bank. Bethel, where Jacob dreamed of a ladder to heaven. Shiloh, the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant. Bethlehem, the birthplace of King David. And Hebron, where the Jewish patriarchs are buried. This is all not just documented in the Bible and in history. It also reveals itself in every inch of the land. In any archeological dig, you just scratch the surface and you find a rich Jewish culture and history of more than 3,500 years, ever since King David built Jerusalem 3,010 years ago. The Jewish rule over Israel was also documented outside the Bible, often by the enemies of Israel. In Egypt, an inscription on the Merneptah Stila proclaimed in the 13th century BC that Israel has been laid waste. In 840 BC, the Moabite king Mesha wrote about the house of David, as did another king a century later, Hazael of Damascus. In the first century AD, the Jewish historian Josephus described in great detail the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and its destruction by the Romans, a story confirmed by a relief in the Arch of Titus in Rome. Every day, archaeology yields more evidence of ancient Jewish culture dating back thousands of years. And in the 20th century, that historical connection has been recognized several times by international law. In 1917, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour issued a declaration calling for a Jewish homeland in Palestine, also known then as Southern Syria. Palestine included at the time all the territory which is now Israel, which is also Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and Jordan. In 1920, Allied leaders gathered in San Remo, Italy to divide the remains of the Ottoman Empire. They created the San Remo Resolution, which incorporated the Balfour Declaration. The resolution was signed by the members of the League of Nations, and the British were put in charge of Palestine. That meant they were legally bound to help the Jewish people build a state there. Two years later, in 1922, the League adopted the British Mandate for Palestine, which recognized the historical connection of the Jewish people and the need for reconstituting their national home there. By that time, the land allocated to the Jewish people had been drastically reduced, with more than 75% of it going to the new Arab Kingdom of Transjordan. The Mandate was signed by all 51 members of the League of Nations, and once again, a Jewish state was guaranteed by international law. 
But 25 years later, that state still existed only on paper. And in 1945, the League was replaced by the United Nations. Article 80 of the UN Charter states that the UN would not alter existing states, peoples, or mandates, which means the UN legally recognized the right of the Jewish people to settle in Palestine, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Up next, a Jewish state mandated by international law. Why the endorsements by the UN didn't stick. The United Nations is the legal successor and inheritor of the League of Nations, which means all obligations, commitments, and pledges of the League of Nations must be upheld by the United Nations. Unfortunately, they did not do it in the case of Israel and the Jewish ownership over their land. In November 1947, the land intended for the Jews was divided once again. The UN voted to partition what was left of Palestine into two parts. 56% would be a Jewish state, with 43% going to an Arab state to be annexed to Jordan. Once again, a Jewish state was mandated by international law. Israel declared its independence in 1948, and a year later, the new state was admitted to the United Nations. But despite numerous legal endorsements, Israel's borders would still be disputed for decades to come as Arab leaders incited violence against Israel. The Mufti, Haj Amin al Husseini, say, what they, they, the United Nations, write with ink, we destroy it by blood. In 2002, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan famously used the phrase illegal occupation to describe Israel's annexation of the West Bank in 1967. But Annan's critics were quick to point out his use of the word illegal was incorrect because the West Bank never legally belonged to Palestinian Arabs in the first place. Palestine was ruled by the Ottoman Turks from 1516 to 1918. Then for the next 30 years, it was controlled by the British until Israel declared its independence. During the war that followed, the Kingdom of Jordan invaded the West Bank and formally annexed the land in 1950. There is a lack of historical understanding and also there is an abuse here by this thing of international law. Since the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, was annexed by Jordan, it was a Jordanian territory, and in 1967, the Six Days War, when Israel had, again, a campaign of self-defense, when three armies of Syria, Jordan, and Egypt were surrounding us, ready to drive us into the sea, Israel won the war, and as a result, we took into possession the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. This land was captured from Jordan. Since Israel recaptured the land from Jordan, it now belongs to Israel, according to international law. One judge on the International Court of Justice wrote the following about the 1967 war. A state acting in lawful exercise of its right of self-defense may seize and occupy foreign territory, as long as such seizure and occupation are necessary to its self-defense. And where the prior holder of territory had seized that territory unlawfully, the state which subsequently takes that territory in the lawful exercise of self-defense has against that prior holder better title. We bought our land in the blood of our soldiers. We didn't start with the war. The Arabs started with the war. All over the world, the idea when someone started with the war and he failed, he paid the price. He paid the price. So why do we have to pay the price now? The last claim the Jewish people make for the land of Israel 
focus is not on how they got it, but what they did with it. Today, Israel's population is well over 8 million. But in 1850, only 350,000 people lived in Israel and the West Bank. In 1857, the British consul in Palestine reported that the area was empty of inhabitants and that its greatest need is a body of population. A decade later, British scientist H.B. Tristram wrote that whole villages there are rapidly disappearing from the face of the earth. An American writer, Mark Twain, wrote this about the Jezreel Valley. There is not a solitary village for 30 miles in either direction. There are two or three small clusters of Bedouin tents, but not a single permanent habitation. Today, many Palestinian Arabs claim that the Jews stole Arab land, evicted the owners, and left thousands of Arab farmers homeless. But is that the real story? Let's take a look. As early as the 1850s, Jewish people started buying land in Palestine but their choices were limited by Arab sellers. The Arabs settled mainly in mountainous areas, and they did not offer those lands for sale. The Arabs wanted to sell land in places where they did not live, in places which they had left in the past. Records show that most of the land purchased by the Jews belonged to a small group of wealthy Muslim families most of whom didn't even live in Palestine. The Arabs were from many walks of life. Effendis who lived in Beirut and in Damascus, as well as locals. Also people who lived in the rural villages. All of them were willing to sell their land. There was always more land available than the demand for them. Still ahead, Gracious treatment extended to Arab workers and landowners in Palestine, as documented by the Peel Commission. From the beginning, the Jewish policy was clear. No Arabs were to be removed from their land against their will. In 1920, Zionist labor leader David Ben-Gurion announced that under no circumstances must we touch land belonging to fellaheen or work by them? Only if a fella leaves his place of settlement should we offer to buy his land at an appropriate price. The Jewish National Fund bought the lands legally in order to fully secure the ownership of these lands. The Arabs were not evicted from the lands. They received compensation and the full process for the lands. That compensation was documented by the British Peel Commission in 1937. The group had been sent to Palestine to investigate clashes between Arabs and Jews. Their report shows that of the 664 Arab workers dispossessed by land sales, 347 were resettled by the British government for free. The rest refused help and found employment elsewhere. Not only did the Jews buy the land legally, they also paid 10 times the normal rate. In 1944, the going rate for rich, fertile soil in Iowa was $110 an acre. While in Palestine, Jews were paying more than $1,000 an acre for arid, rocky land. They say they are crazy. They buy this land. It's dirty land. It's no good land, but they are not stupid and they know that we must work very hard and they work very hard. Look what we have. We are only 66 years old and look what we have already. In the 19th century, life was hard under Ottoman rule for Arab workers in Palestine. Many had lost their farms to heavy Turkish taxes or Bedouin raiders. There were no schools, no electricity, and little sanitation. The average life expectancy for an Arab male in Palestine was 30. With the arrival of the Jewish settlers, 
all of that started to change. With hard work, they turned swamps into vineyards, farms, and citrus groves. They introduced electricity to Palestine and improved the sanitation. They also worked to eradicate the mosquitoes that caused malaria. And the local Arabs benefited from their work. Over a 20-year period, the infant mortality rate for Arab children was cut in half, and the life expectancy for Arab men increased by 12 years. The Jewish landowners hired many of them to help work the land and paid them better than their Arab employers. First of all, following the purchase of land, the Arab population had income. With the help of this money, they could improve their living and the Arab society could raise their standard of living. So because of Jewish purchase of lands, the economic and social conditions of the Arab society were better. Arabs from neighboring countries flocked to Palestine to take advantage of the higher standard of living. From 1922 to 1947, the total Arab population in Palestine more than doubled. In the city of Haifa, the number of Arabs increased by 290%. In Jerusalem, 131%. And in Jaffa, 158%. In 1939, Jewish scholar Martin Buber described the cooperation between Arabs and Jews in a letter to Mahatma Gandhi. The Jewish farmers have begun to teach their brothers, the Arab farmers, to cultivate the land more intensively. Together with them, we want to cultivate the land, to serve it, as the Hebrew has it. The more fertile this soil becomes, the more space there will be for us and for them. We have no desire to dispossess them. We want to live with them. By the time Israel declared independence in 1948, the Jewish people had already built a strong network of communal farms that stretched from the Galilee to the Negev. They'd also built schools, hospitals, roads, and cities. In other words, they were already functioning as an independent state. When Ben-Gurion declared the foundation of the State of Israel in 1948, he already had a base, a territorial foundation of lands and settlements, a large number of settlements spread throughout Israel, settlements built on lands purchased by the Jewish people. Despite the valid historical and legal claims of the Jewish people to their land, Israel's borders are still being negotiated after nearly seven decades of statehood. Even though there is no doubt, not historic, not moral, not archaeological doubt about the connection of Israel to the land and the land to Israel, Israelis are willing to compromise just in order to save lives, just in order to achieve peace. We will wait until we have a partner on the Palestinian side which is trustworthy, which does not believe in the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people as a way to build their own national narrative and willing to live with us in peace and cooperation. Today's stories were excerpts from the CBN documentary, Whose Land Is It? Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. And please keep praying for Israel. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.